Hello everyone and welcome to this topic of today's discussion on radiographic interpretation and radiographic features of diseases manifesting in the jaws. This is the second part of this series of three lectures um, in which the first part we have discussed on principles of interpretation as well as features of radiographic features of diseases manifesting in the jaws part one. I am Dr. Lahari Thelam. The learning outcomes are similar to what were outlined in the previous um, part one of this lecture is to analyze the five principles of radiographic interpretation to identify dental anomalies, um, inflammatory lesions, traumatic conditions, cysts and tumors of the jaws on dental radiographs and explain their clinical and radiographic correlations. Identify and describe the radiographic characteristics of malignancy, systemic diseases and bone diseases affecting the jaws. Summarize the radiographic features of TMJ salivary gland disorders, craniofacial anomalies and paranasal sinus anomalies. In this lecture, we would be specifically stressing on cysts, tumors, malignancies, bone diseases and systemic diseases of the jaws. Let us first start off cysts of the jaws and their radiographic manifestations. Now, what I've tried to do in this lecture is to just stress on the radiographic features and not go into detail of the cyst itself, the clinical features and the other details, which I'm assuming would be covered in another lecture, probably where we've discussed pathology in detail. Let's start off with the simplest and most commonest cyst of the jaw, which is a radicular cyst, generally caused by um, inflammatory condition like dental caries or a tooth which is involving the pulp because of other reasons. In this radiograph here, A and B, you were able to make out that there is a very well-defined radiolucency around the apex of a tooth. Generally, the PDL and the lamina dura are lost and the cyst is originating from the root apices of an infected tooth. Right, so this is the sim same, um, a similar uh, radiograph where the you can see the enlargement on the uh, occlusal view in the bucolingual direction. So that is exactly how the cystic space looks like, and there's a thin rim of sclerotic margin covering the well-defined radiolucency. Next, let's discuss the incisive foramen cyst, uh, or also called as a nasopalatine duct cyst. And let's look at the differences between what is a normal incisive foramen and a cyst in that area. A generally, a normal incisive foramen is less than 5 mm in diameter, the one you can see in the picture over here. Anything larger than that is considered uh, to be a pathology and should, must be investigated and suspected of a nasopalatine duct cyst. In this image here, you can see a very large cyst in the maxillary anterior region uh, with a nice sclerotic margin. Uh, nasopalatine duct cyst is actually a soft tissue uh, cyst which uh, involves the bone and creates a radiolucency in the maxillary anterior region, typically arising from the inside of foramen area. Next is a lateral periodontal cyst. Uh, this is a cyst that arises generally in the periodontium um, or the periodontal ligament space uh, and located between uh, the roots of two roots, uh, two teeth. This is an example of um, a lateral periodontal cyst which is showing a well-defined radiolucency in between the canine premolar uh, region of the maxilla. A lateral radicular cyst is also a radicular cyst and shouldn't be confused for a lateral periodontal cyst. This happens when uh, a cyst forms along a non-vital tooth and generally involves the accessory canals. And uh, hence, even in a lateral radicular cyst or a lateral periodontal cyst, it's important to check the vitality of the tooth to ascertain that it is of pulpal origin and not periodontal in origin. A residual cyst is a term given to a cyst that is left within uh, after post extraction and if the cystic space has not been um, surgically debrided. Now this is the reason why I stress uh, again and again that even if there's a root stump it's important to take a radiograph before extraction is performed. This is to avoid the chances of uh, missing a periapical pathology and leaving behind uh, such a cystic area which in future could um, um, lead to 
uh, getting secondary infected or probably lead to pain or in case you would want to place an implant in that area it becomes an issue because you have discovered on the radiograph that there is a residual cystic area and that uh, you would have to go back in time and uh, go back in uh, <clears throat> and divide the area and perhaps um, um, look for bone harvesting and uh, grafting next is the most one of the most commonest cysts in the jaws is the dentigerous cyst uh, generally arising from the neck of a tooth and again i would um, like you to in understand that radiolucency around a normally impacted tooth which is less than uh, uh, 5 mm could be a hyperplastic dental follicle generally the dental follicle covers all impacted teeth and uh, usually the size of a diameter of the follicle or the size of the follicle from the edge of the follicle to the edge of the crown is just about 1 to 2 mm it can even be considered as a, a hyperplastic follicle or a bigger sized follicle when it's less than 5 mm but anything beyond 5 mm in diameter that means from the edge of the um radiolucency to the crown if it's more than 5 mm in diameter you must suspect a dentigerous cyst um, in this case you can see the third molars are having dentigerous cysts uh, especially typically arising from the neck of the tooth the dentigerous cyst the differential diagnosis would involve an odontogenic character cyst or even a unicystic ameloblastoma. Both of these lesions also can look very similar to dentigerous cysts either in the third molar region or the maxillary canine region which are all favorable sites, um, sites of predilection for uh, both the dentigerous cyst as well as the OKC and unicystic ameloblastoma. OKC um, typically multilocular lesion <clears throat> there are multiple locules with septae separating them and in this particular radiograph you can see that it's a wide lesion about 5 cm in size there's involvement of the mandibular canal at the uh, closer to the end the lesion is very close to the lower border of the mandible there is resorption of uh, quite number of teeth and uh, it shows how aggressive the uh, OKC or endogenic keratocyst is when multiple odontogenic keratosis are suspected then uh, it is important to rule out basal cell nevoid syndrome also called as gorlin syndrome in this particular case you can see that there are uh, multiple cysts in uh, uh, regions of the maxillary um, very close to the maxillary sinus uh, there's one cyst up here in the um, lateral uh, maxillary lateral incisor and canine region and uh, there is one in the ramus with an impacted tooth this one is in the body of the mandible doesn't have an impacted tooth as well as number five which is in again in the third molar ramus and body region having an impacted tooth so okcs uh, need not have impacted teeth always within them they can also arise uh, in the orontogenic region without uh, association with teeth uh, but very close to the orontogenic region and when multiple such OKCs are suspected, it's important to rule out uh, basal cell nevoid syndrome. Amyloblastoma. Uh, the multiple, uh, we've just seen an uh, example of a unicystic amyloblastoma, which can look very much like a dentigerous cyst. Uh, the multilocular variant is generally given the soap bubble appearance. And it's a very classical appearance of the amyloblastoma, where you can see multiple locules. Again, uh, this lesion is quite extensive. Uh, in size about 5 cm in diameter um, in and times 3 cm and it's involving the lower border um, the mandibular canal very close to the lower border of the mandible calcifying odontogenic cyst uh, these cysts are not very common though but they uh, generally involve the mandible uh, can be seen in the anterior region as well as the posterior region of the jaw and there is certain calcification which can be seen within the uh, cystic cavity and so when you see these specks of radio opacity within cystic cavity uh, in a unilocular or uniformly um, defined um, radiolucency it's important to suspect the calcifying odontogenic cyst as part of the differential diagnosis now that we've seen some cysts the most common ones uh, let's look at tumors of the jaws Again, let me remind you in this chapter, I've not gone into the details of clinical features and histopathology of the tumors. I'm just trying to focus on how the radiographic features appear and how you should keep differential diagnosis in mind. 
So let's start off with something which is not a tumor. This is an uh, example of an idiopathic osteosclerosis, uh, generally uh, seen in the odontogenic region, may be associated or closely attached to a tooth or slightly away from the tooth. The differential diagnosis would be condensing ostitis or uh, enostosis. Um, but in this case, you can see that the lamina dura is intact for this molar and the molar doesn't seem to be having any pulp involvement. And hence, this is an idiopathic osteosclerosis. Absolutely benign and uh, can be um, left the way it is and uh, need not receive treatment. This is an example of a cementoma, a large radio opacity, irregularly defined with having a radiolucent rim around it and uh, surrounding the roots of uh, uh, the molar here. And in this case, the uh, molar along with the entire lesion must be surgically excised. And you can see that the radio opacity is actually very closely involving the mandibular canal. On the other hand, cementoblastoma, very closely related histopathologically to a cementoma. Uh, this is an example on the radiograph where you can see mixed radio opacity associated with the effects of a tooth. Uh, you must understand that both cementoma, cementoblastoma are generally arising from the cemental region and uh, it is surrounded by a larger radiolucency, quite mixed in appearance and uh, differential diagnosis of cementoma as well as hypercementosis must be kept in mind. This is hypercementosis, generally seen in teeth which are weight-bearing and have adjacent teeth which are missing. The cementum appears to be um, thickened and widened and uh, it's, it, it appears to be um, fusing with the cementum completely. You can't really make out the uh, enlarged area and it is just excessive amount of cementum deposition that is visible on the radiograph attached to the root apex. <clears throat> Compound and complex orontomas. Compound orontomas are very similar. They can be multiple, impacted or can erupt into the oral cavity as well. Compound orontomas can be very similar to tooth-like structures and some of them might even contain, uh, uh, um, you would be able to differentiate on the radiograph with enamel, dentine and pulp within the orontome itself. Whereas complex orontomas are irregular and uh, do not really um, have a shape. They're just masses of um, uh, depositions which can be uh, it's very difficult to make out where the enamel dentine and pulp are so these are both cases of impacted compound and complex orontomas uh, bear in mind that these can cause impaction of the teeth and uh, uh, when present for example in this case the, is, there's an impacted uh, uh, canine here and the complex orontoma is obstructing the path of eruption of the canine Adenomatoid ontogenic tumor, also called as AOT, a uh, classical area of involvement is the maxillary canine region. You would see that the radiolucency surrounds the canine with uh, multiple small tiny radiopaque flecks seen within the well-defined radiolucent area. This is an adenomatoid ontogenic tumor. The calcifying epithelial orontogenic tumor, CEOT, um, also has the appearance of what is called as a driven snow. Uh, it is um, appears mixed radiopaque and radiolucent and uh, not clearly defined or demarcated areas and can generally involve the posterior mandible. Uh, can appear sometimes like a, a mixed um, appearance where you're seeing a lot of opacification and locule-like areas, but the locules are not as defined as a multilocular radiolucency. These appear more ill-defined and hence the appearance of driven snow. Osteoma is a tumor arising from the bone. These could be, uh, they are benign and they could be osteoid osteomas or peripheral osteomas. Generally, the mandible is involved. The osteoid osteoma is within the body of the mandible and the peripheral osteoma generally uh, extends out of the body of the mandible or the lower body of the mandible is one of the most uh, favorite sites for an osteoma. Exostosis, these are actually not tumors, they are hematomas. They, this is an example of mandibular uh, uh, bilateral bony exostosis. They can also be seen in as buccal exostosis in the maxilla as well. Osteochondroma, this is just an example of how there's an enlargement um, of the condyle of the TMJ. 
and uh, again not very common but uh, arising from the uh, TMJ the coronoid condylar process and uh, this is how it appears on the radiograph uh, large radio opacity um, which is uh, having well defined borders now that we've looked at the um, tumors and cysts uh, let's look at malignancies of the jaws radiologic features of malignancies of the jaws uh, when we're talking about diagnosing malignancy based on the radiograph it is important to understand that it would be very difficult for you to suspect the type of radio or uh, type of malignancy but it's um, important what is important to understand is that the manifestations of malignancies in the jaws and how they look different from benign uh, lesions and and what is important to look at so when we're talking about that, it is important to keep in mind that radiologic features of malignancies can either manifest as ill-defined invasive borders, uh, lesions with borders which are ill-defined, destruction of cortical boundary with adjacent soft tissue mass could be there, uh, there could be irregular thickening of the PDL due to the invasion, uh, for example the one seen here, and they could be multifocal lesions like multiple of them involving uh, the bone there could be effects on cortical bone or the periosteal reaction um, which is an example of the onion peel appearance or a codman's triangle or a sunburst appearance and also the appearance of teeth floating in space uh, which happens because of uh, dis extensive destruction of the bone and a large radiolucent defect left inside the um, jawbone so essentially these are methods these are uh, ways in which the malignancy manifests in the jaws but again i'm pointing out and reminding you that it's impossible virtually impossible to tell suspect what type of malignancy it is histologically so what we've seen was, seen was diagrammatic representation on the radiograph per se what you could see for example on a ct scan would be break in cortical margins with irregular appearance of the radiolucency or soft tissue mass which is seen um, with the bone involvement and ill-defined radiolucency like the one seen around the molar you could also see irregular radio opacities which are ill-defined and um, very dense in appearance and also masses which are completely involving the maxillary sinus and um, giving an irregular appearance uh, with not uniform density uh, which all are suspicious of malignancies of the jaws even if it is having a, there is a metastatic carcinoma to the jaw it is again very difficult to differentiate what type of metastasis it is or is it a primary tumor of the jaw or is it a metastatic carcinoma they would appear on similar lines to any malignancy in the jaw with ill-defined radiolucencies and no obvious uh, dental causes or appearance with the periosteal reaction of the bone um, and cort cortical bone having um, ill-defined radio opacifications uh, which do not look benign this is an example of osteosarcoma with the sun ray appearance uh, or this also called a sunburst appearance which is a periosteal reaction and uh, osteosarcoma is a very aggressive uh, malignancy of the jaw and uh, this is the appearance uh, pointed out by the um, white arrow marks uh, Langerhans cell cystiocytosis. I've just uh, cited this example over here. Though clinically, this is the manifestation of the lesion on the radiograph. Again, it's very difficult to differentiate between uh, periodontitis. It can pass off as a chronic periodontitis if you weren't correlating it with clinical features. And hence, the malignancy gives the appearance of ill-defined radiolucency and a lot of bone loss. Um, uh, like I told you, there are multiple factors that go into diagnosis of malignancies of the jaws. Uh, clinical features, uh, histological features, and radiolucency radiographic features combined together should help in um, arriving at a diagnosis. Uh, let's move on to bone diseases involving the jaws and specifically we would be looking at some fibrosis uh, lesions. 
So the most common is fibrous lesions that we generally describe is the fibrous dysplasia and these images give you the appearance of um, orange peel appearance. Uh, that is what is called in radiology terminology where you see the trabecular pattern strikingly different from the adjacent normal trabecular pattern in this uh, first molar whereas the second mandibular molar's bone surrounding it shows you um, ill-defined uh, thinned out trabeculae very similar to that of an orange peel appearance. So uh, clinically you would be able to see that um, there is a bony swelling and um, enlargement on uh, either one or a few, few areas of the bone. Uh, again, another appearance of fibrous dysplasia, this is more like a ground glass appearance, Gra ground glass appearance uh, involving the entire maxillary sinus and uh, maxilla uh, on the radiograph on the CT scan also shows a large uh, radio opacity and this is what is called as ground glass, that means glass which is not transparent but appearance um, appears uh, hazy. Fibrous dysplasia can also manifest as a fingerprint appearance. This is what we are uh, discussing about the fingerprint appearance of seen in the mandible. And in this particular case, two areas in the mandible are showing similar kind of uh, appearance of fibrous dysplasia. Periapical cemental dysplasia is uh, a disease uh, involving primarily um, the starting off of the cementum and the predilection for lower anteriors. Um, this disease has uh, three stages to it, stage 1 to 3 and as the lesion progresses from stage 1 to 3, it starts off as radiolucent area with ill-defined margins, um, then moves on to a mixed radiolucent radio opaque appearance and then finally there is um, excessive amount of radio opacity. Now, the progress from stage 1 to stage 3 can take uh, quite a few years to happen and generally the teeth are vital and the patient is asymptomatic. So I've also listed out here the differential diagnosis based on the appearance. This could be, um, uh, you know, the rarefying ostitis could have been thought of as a differential diagnosis for stage 1. For stage 2 with mixed appearing lesions, condensing ostitis can be thought of as uh, a differential diagnosis and um, for stage 3, where there is a radiolucent periphery around the radio opacity, a benign cementoblastoma or even the presence of an odontome attached to the uh, apex of a tooth can be thought of as differential diagnosis. Focal cemento-osseous dysplasia is the terminology used when uh, similar uh, peripical cemental dysplasia is seen in the molar region. Uh, also, the appearance is very similar to the previous case uh, with the differential diagnosis of benign cementoblastoma or dense bone island. Irregular radio opacity with the rim of radiolucency seen very close to the periapex of teeth. The term florid cementosious dysplasia, also called as gigantiform cementoma or familial multiple cementomas, is given to the appearance where there are multiple areas of uh, opacification seen. Again, uh, this can be involving multiple teeth of the jaws. The differential diagnosis would be Peds disease or chronic sclerosing osteomyelitis. Cemento ossifying fibroma or also ossifying fibroma or cementifying fibroma. This is um, a generally gives the appearance of mixed radio opaque radiolucent appearance with uh, uh, multilocular appearance as well. There is expansion of the jaw in the bacolingual direction as could be anterior posterior direction as well. And uh, it is a bony heart swelling generally and this is the appearance of the uh, opacification seen in the jaws. The cemento ossifying fibroma could also have a peripheral component to it with enlargement into the oral ca uh, cavity. And when this happens, you could have a differential diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia, peripical cemental dysplasia if the area is small, or central giant cell granuloma, or a COC or a CEOT. Uh, this is an example of a central giant cell granuloma. This is a reactive lesion and uh, you would see that there is enlargement of the jaw in this patient here where you can see that the chin area is showing a swelling and when you look at it intraorally, there is vestibular obliteration. On the occlusal view, you can see that there is an ill-defined mixed radiolucent radio-opaque appearance involving considerable area uh, right from the lateral incisor to the um, central incisor to the molar region and a large radiolucency seen in in the panoramic radiograph. Generally, central giant cell granuloma uh, is a lesion which is seen anterior to the premolar region and it can cross the uh, midline. 
Cherubism, um, again, a rare but uh, possibility that you would have multiple bone involvement, maxilla and mandible can be involved, multilocular appearance and you would feel that the teeth are uh, floating in the multilocular appearance, hard bony swellings um, with uh, a, a long term treatment plan and um, <clears throat> for the patient who uh, has this condition. Paget's disease, uh, also called as osteitis deformans, it's a skeletal disorder involving osteoclasts resulting in an abnormal deposition and resorption of bones. Um, you generally see uh, osteolytic lesions, which could be seen on the skull over here, um, called as osteoporosis circumscripta. At advanced stages, the term cotton wool appearance is used with the entire uh, um, skull or the jaw involved, where bone involved appears like uh, whitish because of the radio opacity and excessive um, abnormal deposition or resorption of bone. So moving on to systemic diseases manifested in the jaw, we've just looked at uh, um, bone diseases and now we're going to look at systemic diseases. Now again it is important to come, bear in mind that based on radiographic characteristics alone, it is not possible to determine the underlying systemic disease. Um, the general changes included in the bone can probably give you the suspicion that there could be systemic involvement. So these changes would be a change in size and shape of bone, change in number, size and orientation of trabeculae, altered thickness and density of cortical structures, and an increase or decrease in overall bone density. Let's look at some examples, starting with hyperparathyroidism. Now, the, the bone lesion in hyperparathyroidism is called as a brown tumor. It is not named behind anyone. It's just because of the <coughs> appearance of the bone, which appears very brownish in color. There's increased circulating parathyroid hormone, increased bone remodeling, increased mobilization of calcium from the skeleton, and increased serum calcium levels. And hence, there are uh, radiolucent lesions within the jaw, which you can see over here in this case. There is excessive amount of radiolucency and a defect like a radiolucent defect like appearance within the bone so like we told you just now like i told you it's important to understand that just based on the radiograph you would not be able to understand that there is what type of systemic disorder it is but you could suspect that there is some um, systemic involvement and hence there is changes in the bone density uh, again, with the uh, hyperparathyroidism, you could see this uh, salt and pepper appearance of the skull. And once the lesion or the disease process is corrected, the skull can actually return back to normal or any bone can be returning back to normal after the treatment is done. Hyperpituitarism, um, gigantism or acromegaly, uh, you can see this picture taken from um, one of the sources where you can see that the size of the skeleton itself is very large. The pituitary cella tersica region also appears very large. Rickets and osteomalacia, inadequate serum and extracellular levels of uh, calcium and phosphate are uh, hallmark of this uh, disease. There is defect in the normal activity of metabolites of vitamin uh, D, ex, uh, especially 1,2,5-cholecalciferol, uh, which is required for resorption of calcium in the um, intestine. So rickets, in rickets, there is hypoplasia, hypocalcification of teeth. There is an osteomalacia, which happens in adults, gen generally does not alter the teeth because they are fully developed before the onset of the disease itself. So this is uh, some examples of rickettsial appearance of the teeth which are very hollow they look like shells and they, because there is less amount of hyp or hypocalcification of the teeth also the um, bending of the bones which can be seen in a uh, child who's having uh, rickets Osteopetrosis, uh, quite rare, but it is also called as marble bone disease. It's an inherited disorder of the bone that results from defect in differentiation and function of osteoclast. This abnormal formation of uh, primary skeleton and a general increase in the bone mass. The failure of normal bone remodeling results in dense, fragile bones that are susceptible to fracture and infection. This is an example of sickle cell anemia and thalassemia, which gives the appearance of hair on end uh, appearance. This is caused by the uh, superficial surface of the dura uh, being raised and appearing like as though there is hair on the end of the skull. And also increased trabecular spaces and wide marrow spaces, which is a classical feature of sickle cell anemia or uh, thalassemia.
So that brings me to the end of this chapter. I have given you examples of different types of uh, uh, radiographic appearances seen in the bone and uh, the diseases that, that we've covered are just few examples. For more uh, information and in-depth reading, I would suggest that you go through the textbook and look through the examples. Uh, and it's very important as I keep on reinforcing and making, you, um, making it clear that if the, to understand and to retain radiology it's very important that you keep looking at images which um, your eyes recognize and um, it's easier for you to um, compare it to something which is abnormal or something which is normal and that's how you retain the information that you um, and, and that's how you learn and interpret and uh, practice radiology uh, thank you very much if you do still have any doubts kindly uh, feel free to contact me